So we'll just get started here and let everybody come in as they do. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the February Knowledge Exchange Cafe. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, i is a community of practice for researchers, students, and other professionals working in NTDs with a focus on the social and behavioral sciences. So our knowledge cafes are a way to help share the interesting research that is being done in this area to help facilitate knowledge exchange and collaboration between NTD professionals around the world. So the focus of the session today will address utilizing community-based groups to operationalize integrated skin NTD strategies at the community level in response to the WHO 2030 NTD roadmap. Today, our moderator for the discussion will be Dr. Laura Dean. Laura is a social scientist at the lecture, social scientist and lecturer at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Laura's work centers on participatory research approaches to develop and evaluate interventions to provide holistic support and work in partnership with people affected by NTDs. Laura has worked on the development and delivery of peer support interventions in partnership with national ministries of health in Nigeria, Liberia, and the DRC, with a key focus on their integration with larger mental health support systems. So thank you for joining us today, Laura, and for your time to moderate our session. And our speaker for today is Guillermo Robert. Guillermo is the technical advisor for global health at Effect Hope Canada, with more than 10 years of experience in global health, he has influenced a number of international debates and operational approaches in the fields of operational and intervention effectiveness research, health system and strengthening, treatment compliance, program management, advocacy and m and &E systems, and he lectures on disability prevention at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he is a member of the editorial board of the Leprosy Review Journal. And so thank you for Guillermo for being our speaker today and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Should I just jump in? Yep, my turn, right? Yeah, your okay. turn. Take okay. your it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and the, the entire uh, ICOTS uh, team to, to, to kindly invite me for, for this um, uh, Knowledge Exchange Cafe. It's my first time. I know only a few of you, uh, only a few faces are familiar to me at present. And um, well, I, I didn't know about this, uh, the, the audience, so uh, forgive me if I am using um, the wrong rhetoric in some of the slides. Anyway, I'll try my best. I'm going to share my screen now. There you go. Can you see my screen? Yep, excellent. All right. Well, this um, a presentation is about community-based groups, um, often called self-help, self-support, self-care groups in the context of NTDs. And, and the idea is really uh, to spark some interest um, among you to see uh, CVGs or community-based groups as a possible model uh, to consider in accelerating WHO 2030 targets. Um, let me, I mean, through, through the presentation, I'm gonna try to contextualize uh, CVGs or, or community groups um, about five minutes to, to settle some concepts I think is, are, are very relevant, at least in our experience at FED Hope and in collaboration with our uh, partners. It's also, um, I, I'm going to spend some time also in, in developing the, the concept of behavior change in self-care interventions within the context of, of CBGs. And I'll be um, sharing some considerations that came from our own experience when designing CBG models. And, and, and also, finally, I'm going to share some examples of CPG models that were implemented in the Indian settings um, and, and used at FED Hope for, for the last five, six years. Okay, here we go. Um, let's start with some context. I think, I mean, we, we, all, thunk, we, we, we all agree here that the CPG concept is, is not new at all. It's, it's, it has 
uh, uh, many years now, particularly in the area of HIV. I remember when I joined the, um, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, industry more than 10 years ago, um, HIV uh, were, well, the community of HIV were targeting community groups uh, for compliance, for stigma aspects and, and so on. So it's not new at all. And within the entity context, it's also not new, perhaps it's more heterogeneous, but what has a common or, or the cross-cutting element, perhaps in the entity context, is the um, common problem that members or participants of such groups um, join together. And this problem is, is perhaps we can agree is, is disability, is morbidity, is the long-term condition that, that um, um, has a, a common problem. And this common problem make people join together for self-care to start with. That's not the only reason they join together. And we're gonna explain this further, but, but uh, because this concept of CVGs in the entity context have not been defined, uh, at least till recently. And the implementation is highly heterogeneous. So a cross-cutting element is definitely self-care. But the, the concept has evolved over the last 10 years, at least, uh, substantially. So the WHO has recently redefined or, or, or tried to, to define the concept of CVG, as you know, is, is marked in, in orange at the very top. And the concept uh, stays around in the self-care or self-support groups are informal groups of people affected uh, who come together to share common problems and support each other. I think that's a cross-cutting, uh, irrespective of uh, how we call self-care, self-support, or self-care um, groups. But WHO makes a step further here, and, 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 and they mention not only health issues are addressed within CBGs, but also emotional needs and depression, social discrimination, and livelihoods. This is a new concept that was developed only under the concept of self-help groups in some settings, particularly in Bangladesh where they deal with livelihoods in, um, in, in silo diseases approaches. Um, eh, also, the context of, of self-care has evolved to social participation. And this is something I want to uh, dig deeper over the next slides. Other um, eh, definitions from different leprosy organizations um, identify the self-care groups or support groups as, as, as people that gather together that are responsible. So in, with the idea of being responsible in managing their own conditions and the, empower, the, 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 empower, the empowerment element is, is, is highlighted. And also uh, around the income generation and the fact at the very bottom uh, is that groups provides benefits to their villages indicating some elements around advocacy and participating beyond the groups, which is, I think, uh, relevant for settling this thing here. Do you mind this uh, background noise? There you go, thank you. So the earlier definition from WHO comes from the, the strategic framework from integrated control and management of skin and TDs which is really a companion document to the WHO 2030 uh, roadmap. This document, the, the strategic framework, specifically um, recognizes CBGs as important person-centered approaches and key platforms to, to leverage the empowerment of, of community members affected. So they have control over decision and activities that affect their, their health and their ability to participate in society. And I think it's clear that this document has been mm, influenced by the uh, international uh, classification of functioning by developed by WHO in 22, where disability is an umbrella term for impairments, um, uh, activity limitations, and participation restrictions. I think that's very relevant to understand the concept of, of, of CVGs and how important they are uh, and, uh, and the opportunities they raise in integrating multiple diseases, multiple entities. So this rhetoric, uh, um, I think describes the, the, uh, the negative aspects of this binomy uh, or this interaction between the, the, the health situation of a person affected and the individual context. And, and the call here is, I guess, clearly clear. It's, it's basically to address the healthcare needs, considering both individual and environmental factors. Um, I'm going to move further. Um, other important aspect before jumping into specific self-care and to justify why 
community-based groups are so relevant in achieving WHO targets. Uh, uh, is that um, is is the topic is the is the importance around empowerment, empowering empowered communities, and the importance of of their role in 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 developing effective and sustainable entity control programs, so as to accelerate WHO 2030 targets. Um, there is a very interesting paper by Marshall and others in, in developing in, in in 2011. Uh, this paper is basically around the interface between entity control programs and, and healthcare systems. And at one extreme, we, we have the entity uh, control program, uh, perhaps initially developed vertical, uh, where the target is mainly on reducing the burden of disease. The focus may be on the presence of a disease in the population from a health problem point of view, and, and where decisions are mainly taken from a cost efficient point of view. And it, it is normally target oriented. And at the other extreme, have, we have the, the healthcare systems where our focus more on the suffering, on the long-term needs of people affected, and, and therefore uh, requires some people-centered approach. So the, the rationale behind this paper is that entity programs can be integrated or, or mainstream the health system in many different ways. But the principle is that successful um, entity programs require health system to function by mobilizing resources, for instance, Although the, the, the true positive synergy between the two um, require alignment of, of program uh, goals with, with, the, with the priorities of, of local communities. Uh, and, and here's where empowered communities um, play a, a big, big role. It's basically about um, involving communities in decision making bottom up. It's about developing sustainable and effective control programs by bringing the communities at the very, very beginning. And this is the, at the core of, of CBGs. Um, oops, sorry. All right, well, here are another um, couple of, of papers identifying the importance of, of community participation in, 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 in uh, developing successful effective and, and, and sustainable um, health programs. But this, this, this common um, factors, organization, needs assessment, the social processes that are normally identified in community uh, participation to achieve uh, better uh, health outcomes in, in, in entity control programs. All these factors, I think there are, um, the, the, the bottom line around here, I think is the, is that these are common factors found in any formative evaluation that we normally do, for instance, to assess um, the situation around MMDP in LF or how DMDI services are being uh, utilized in a given setting. So we normally uh, come with the conclusion that we need to mobilize community members so that health systems need to be strengthened bottom up right from the, uh, from the community. I think that's a, a key takeaway from, from these initial slides. All right, let's move um, further with self-care and behavior change. Uh, it is clear, I think, by all of us that preventing disability is a key control strategy to achieve WHO targets. Uh, it has, uh, I, I, am only, I only highlight I leprosy at the left and, and LF at the very right. In, in the, at the NNN, um, uh, Dr. Irwin, the former representative of the Global Leprosy Program uh, presented the new strategy and, and the roadmap where he highlighted that leprosy burden, for example, is not only about new uh, cases affected by leprosy, but also affected people that have already uh, disabilities. So it's, it's, it's also considering, uh, so in controlling leprosy, we need to also consider the backlog of people already affected that can potentially develop disabilities. Uh, similar with MNDP in, um, in, in the LF strategy, where now it's a key pillar. And, and self-care is considered as a core strategic intervention to achieve um, these goals. Um, there may be nuances and differences between the approaches, but we can map this out. In fact, we have developed multiple mapping strategies, and not only leprosy and LF, but CBGs, for example, concentrated on self-care. We use uh, even, uh, you know, podoconiosis. We can use uh, onco. We can use. Uh, we can include uh, scabies, for example, scabies, LF, and leprosy. Uh, we are now testing um, a CB integrated CBGs in the Indian setting. 
um, hygiene is not only about is is about identifying the right elements that are cross cutting in each disease whilst maintaining the, the core focus. The problem, however, is that we realized a few years ago that self-care training alone is often not sufficient. Look at the two pictures. This is basically a left. And it's definitely not the same thing. Um, a training, for example, developing or, or, or delivering a, a training package to the person on the left than on the person on the right. The situation is totally different. The person on the right is likely to, to, to require family support and, and other kind of, of healthcare education or an, an lifelong support also. At the very left, you, you, you can see some of the results we found in 2018 in one of the projects we implemented in Samastipur, India, about uh, in, in 2018. Uh, after three years of the intervention, systematically training community members, well, affected people with um, LF. Um, in the community through skin camps and self-support groups focused on self-care, um, we found after three years that 90% mm, reported self-care knowledge. And other, but 59% but reported a performing a daily self-care. When we try to investigate quantitative some of these elements, then the, the numbers just dropped. And, and the exercise in particular um, was performed, of course, this was linked to stage two and higher in LF and, and the exercise, when we broke it down, we found a variety of options. So in essence, basically only 25% of the population in Tibet, that there was 400 people, uh, actually uh, practice self-care properly. And, and with, with, a, with a, an acute attack rate of 50% uh, over the last three months, that was what was reported. That's actually a failure. And we realize here that something else was, was uh, need to be considered. Uh, look at this um, slide. This is, um, this is, uh, this is the, the, the dynamics of ulcer occurrence in the leprosy context. And, and see how complex are the dynamics to produce, uh, uh, to, 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 to develop an ulcer. In, 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 for, for example, in leprosy, uh, it is the anesthesia or loss of the sweat on the sole of your feet, for example, where it is, uh, this, is called a, a, this is the primary impairment that if left unattended can develop injuries, deformity, increased pressure, sharing stress, or even skin dry developing ulcers. The thing is that the dynamics, lots of environmental factors um, are, they should be taken into consideration. Where is this person working? Is he using a bicycle to work? Is, is what about uh, the season? Is it the rainy season? Uh, he needs to collect, to, to harvest, to go to the fields, rice fields. Uh, what is the, the walking habits at so on? What is the quality of the food we're used? And same with the, uh, the influencing factors. At the end, this is intervention. This is may, maybe a, a theory of change, for example, a simplified theory of change, which is um, basically highlighting that there are a number of external and internal factors that needs to be taken into consideration. This is like the black box of a theory of change. And one important factor is motivation. Motivation is critical. This is an important paper developed by um, colleagues from uh, Tilly, England and Wales, and also from the University of Birmingham. I think that's very interesting. They are using um, a, a model, a well-known model based on capabilities, opportunities, and motivation behavior framework on the very left that was developed a few years ago. And it's well-known in the behavior change uh, community. And, and they try to apply these behavior psychology principles into uh, self-care programs for people affected by leprosy, highlighting again, the, the importance of motivation as a trigger for behavior change. And, and this is, I think, this is um, very relevant in, in, in self-support groups. Uh, and this goes beyond the self-care instructions. And this is why there is this principle uh, Hugh Cross mentioned in 2018, self-care is far beyond obeying instructions. We cannot say, we cannot integrate multiple skin entities together under the principle of delivering or using the groups just to deliver uh, self-care packages. Uh, well, this is the same paper, basically highlighting self-support groups or peer support groups as a means to uh, increase motivation. 
the peer support element and beyond the, the self-care uh, uh, domains, the elements of skin care, wound care, exercise. It is this um, uh, health education component that goes within the concept of CVGs. Another very important aspect, I think this is, um, this is to me, this is my favorite slide, in, <laughs> to be honest. This is um, the importance of seasonality. Uh, seasonality is normally um, uh, often uh, forgotten when designing uh, self-care interventions, also within CVGs, of course. But I think this is critical. Look, this is the um, this is a project funded by by Current CD, uh, two years ago. It was called Umid Project, and we found that seasonality had a big role in the occurrence or the incidence of acute attacks among people affected by lymphedema. And, 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 and this is the intervention arm, basically. So you can see the, the, the project started in June, but then soon after, the, uh, this, this is basically a study across four blocks of India and measure in, across, you know, the, the monitoring period was one year, but we can see a peak, an average peak between July and November. This means that irrespective of how we intervene, there will mainly be a peak. We have, uh, we have uh, compared this with other um, uh, settings in India. We found similar findings. Depending on the context, this peak may vary, of course, right? Depending on, on where, what country, when is the rainy season. But this peak is telling us a lot. This is the rainy season for, for, for Bihar. This is also the, the, the mosquito breeding period, and also the seeding. Uh, um, which has a, an implication for acute attacks. There are festivals in October, in September, where the, where the hygiene uh, practice is very low. You, you can imagine how many CBT opportunities we have here to target education, but it, this, this also uh, um, is telling us how, over, how much we may overestimate impact or underestimate it, depending on where we set the evaluation period or the baseline. Depends on, on this is, uh, I think this is critical uh, to, to uh, I mean, even if for, for integrating multiple skin CDs, for, for, for leprosy, for example, we know the hot period has, uh, uh, is more likely to develop ulcers and they, 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 work, they work barefoot, but also in the rainy season um, or the, the, the breathing period here, we can uh, integrate multiple diseases such as LF, dengue, chikungunya, uh, kalasar, many uh, diseases can be potentially uh, addressed through CVGs, as we're going to see in, in a minute. Well, these are other key considerations. Uh, um, uh, the health education component, as mentioned earlier, monitoring. Monitoring is, is oh, sorry, monitoring is, is critical. Monitoring goes, it's not only about uh, the data, but also it's about motivation, about mental health, access to social uh, entitlements, seasonality, as mentioned, coordination with government city programs, networking, bottom up designing based on, on local knowledge, uh, sustainability as a core focus from the very beginning, advocacy and the dependence on multiple skin integration opportunities. Well, this is a model, uh, the UMID model, uh, that was the, the one funded by, by Corinth City uh, two years ago. We developed several, um, the focus was on LF. Uh, we, you can see at the very, at the center, multiple self-care elements. We also investigated the possible integration of leprosy. This uh, study will be published soon. The community awareness was in, in integrated here, and we identify a big number of hydrocell cases where was uh, were uh, und, uh, were 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 living uh, undiagnosed basically. But we added two important components here, which is the monitoring or motivational visits every month, and and further further when needed, the the the, the we brought in trained uh, from like frontline workers, and we integrated counseling in these um, monitoring visits addressing multiple factors. Well, this is basically some of the effects of this project after one year of intervention. You can see at the very bottom uh, with no intervention and the number of acute attacks in, in, in a square at the top and how this evolved. The, the, the second bit is CBGA. That means um, we use this as, as an arm. And this was basically self-care training and counseling basically focus on self-care, but our intervention is about CBTB, which included also the enhanced counseling program and monthly visits. We can see how um, uh, not only the self-care practice improves,
but also how um, the, the, the incidence of acute attacks drop over time. I'm gonna go through, otherwise um, I'm afraid we won't have time. This is another model. This is the Aspire model. This is a project we are now developing. It had uh, lots of media coverage in India. We have already implemented this, this model. And this is basically the next step starting from, from this is we are piloting. This is funded internally by Effet Hope and, and, and Lepra UK. And, and this is what we want to try here is to basically embed um, a, a, a community-based, a CBG integrating multiple diseases. These are leprosy, LF and scabies. And integrating, um, well, with the same concept of UMIT, but in an holistic model, assuming that integrated in a, you know, a, 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 um, linking CBGs with a number of community awareness programs, but also linking them to integrated active case funding, addressing multiple diseases where uh, were not reported or documented in the government systems like left continuous leishmaniasis, PICA, DLS, caves and fungal diseases. And then, of course, there's a strong component on health system strengthening to develop um, essential care packages, but all through empowered uh, CBGs coming from the bottom up. And this is the last uh, slide. This is, uh, I know, Rachel, I know uh, <laughs> it's four minutes. This is my, my last slide. Uh, this is the Uplift project. This is a new project that has been recently funded by, by ILEP, the International um, leprosy forum of, of NGOs. Um, uh, this is mainly about uh, developing um, a, a harmonized and scalable model of CVGs. Uh, of course, focus on leprosy, but with the potential of scaling that up and integrating multiple con uh, modules. This has a formative phase where uh, LSTM is kindly supporting us in that process. And where through a consultation process, we aim to have like a more harmonized CBG startup package, uh, considering, for example, the add-ons of mental health. This is very recent uh, scenario. How we can, what is the best uh, way to integrate uh, mental health interventions within the CBG context? And also, for example, livelihoods, what are the necessary um, uh, resources to integrate livelihoods into a CBGs, into a CBG model? behavioral theories, um, self-care uh, components. Are we missing something to maximize the effects of CVGs on health outcomes and sustainability of the program? And of course, in a second phase, the implementation phase, we will test the validation of such model together with some other uh, mental health activities to see what is the added or, or added effect of, of additional uh, mental health components. Well, I think that's it. I'll stop here. I'll open the door for discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo, and thank you for being so punctual with your presentation. Um, I really appreciated what you shared in terms of the um, importance of involving the, the community and the members um, when you're bringing um, interventions to them. And, you know, if if you, you can tell, you can provide the best medicine and you can provide the best um, interventions, but if the environment isn't there to support that, um, then it can only go so far. So thank you for, for the shop thoughts that you shared today. And I'll pass it along to Laura to moderate our discussion. So if, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll be happy to, to answer those. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks, Guillermo. A really interesting presentation, and I thought you highlighted really well how social and structural conditions really shape the, as well as being drivers of NTDs, they kind of are shaping the success or, or challenges that a lot of CBG models um, experience. There's a question in the in the chat linked to that already from Alison, um, just linked to the points you raised about seasonality. And, and given the impact that seasonality has on acute attacks, would you be able to comment what's the best to well, when is best to plan interventions and subsequent evaluations? Okay, thank you, uh, Lauren. Thanks, um, Alison, for the question. I think I mean I, I love that question because that's that's really something in progress, and I really think that can have a big impact. Um, I mean, 360, 
is 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 it, this goes beyond um, self care. I think the impact should be seen uh, holistically. For example, think of MDA campaigns. We have evidence already. It's great literature, but I'm sure uh, that CVGs can have an impact on on MDA compliance. Um, CVGs uh, in in the Aspire model, for example, we brought. Um, we are bringing CVGs into pre-MDA campaigns to raise the uh, awareness on, on LF. So uh, working as, 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 as champions in a way to, to increase. This already worked uh, in other blocks of India. We could we can publish, we don't have um, good quality on the findings, but we, we have enough um, uh, statements for that. So when to plan uh, the, the training and the activities, when I think that goes throughout the, the year. So when is the MDA campaign settled? We, we are planning, we are anticipating that. For example, MDA campaign in, in, uh, happened this month. So one month earlier, uh, let's uh, connect with government services so they can engage with pre-MDA and bring CPG members to that. Not only LF people affected, affected by LF, but also other members of the community such as LF, leprosy or, or scabies. Same with uh, in the rainy season, for example. The rainy season, um, we know the flooding area, it is, it is uh, critical uh, for fungal or scabies, same as summer. Summer, the, the, the sweating um, is also likely to develop more, more fungal or scabies, uh, about plantar ulcers. So it's all around or, or marriage in between, in between April and May in India. There's lots of marriage events. There's low hygiene practice. So let's capitalize on that. I think that's very context-based, context, context based depending on the country. But I think right from the design at the project, at the very beginning, thinking in terms of seasonal um, consequences or the opportunities that, that seasonality may, may, may bring to the, to the program, we can definitely maximize the, the impact of the project. Thanks, Guillermo. That really interesting um, reflections. Um, Please do, if others have questions, pop them in the chat or, or feel free to, to raise your hand. We've got about 30 minutes, so a good amount of time for, for conversation questions. Please also share reflections from your, from your own experience or with CBG models that we'd, we'd love to hear, to hear about those as well. Um, there's a question here in the chat for you um, from Daniel. And he's asking how we can effectively promote community engagement to ensure the acceptability of new interventions. And I guess a follow on question from me linked to that as well would be, you talked a lot about around motivation. And so how do we, how do we involve people affected in the design of these interventions as well as their delivery to, to, to kind of increase that, that motivation as well? Thanks, Laura. Can you, can you repeat the first question? Yes, it's about community engagement and how we promote it to ensure the acceptability of new interventions. So thinking about community engagement, motivation and a new intervention design and delivery. Yeah, well, that's that's a personal opinion. I think uh, many people may have different experiences. Um, but in my, in my personal opinion, a very important aspect to consider. I mean, CVGs have rarely brought interest over the last, that's, let's face it, right? Uh, CBG, the CBG concept over the last 20 years, how much funding they received. This, this has been implemented vertically by, and, and mainly led by NGOs. This is the reality. But I think we are playing a new scenario. We are in a new scenario here where we have a number of CBGs that have evolved. And the, 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 what I'm trying to, to, to raise here is the development, the different, the development stages that the CBG suffer or, or, or face through, throughout time. So it's not the same thing as CVG at the very beginning, but a CVG that has been together for five years, uh, capable of conducting lots of advocacy. We can see the example in Bangladesh, for example, in, in, in the Bogra Federation. They, 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 are, they are strong and formal forums of people affected that join together through CVGs. That's the mechanism together. So the very beginning, of course, we need to provide some te some technical support, resources, uh, training packages, or whatever. But the decisions, the, the role of participants, enhance or, or increase over time as they are as they are um, as they are identified within the group. I think it's a process. So, uh, for example, one of the papers I, I I showed at the very beginning is about. 
um, the needs assessment. Needs assessment is normally conducted at the very beginning, it's top down. It's, it's, if we have the opportunity of bringing on people affected right from the beginning, excellent. But the reality, sometimes this is not entirely feasible. So we need, you need to set. So for example, how CPGs are created. Sometimes the, the route is by identifying new people. They are invited to form CVGs as they, as they are identified. And, and the common problem is self-care. So as, as, as soon as they see the benefits of self-care is where, uh, where, you see, uh, where you see motivation increase. At least that's, that's my experience. And as you move forward, forward through, throughout time, you can see you, you bring them in into discussions and decision and everything, uh, all the plans comes through them and, and by them. But that I think that's a process. Thanks, Guillermo. We often see with these participatory processes, they, they take time and can be driven by a, a, a kind of single advocate and often recognising capacities and, um, and kind of um, assets within communities it can be a, a good starting point in, in the creation of, of these models. Um, Alamayu, I can see you've got your hand up and I hope I've pronounced your, your name correctly. Yeah, you did it correctly. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very nice presentation. Uh, I have two issues. Uh, the first thing is a logistic issue. Who will provide the logistic for uh, those patients? As we know, the patients who are affected by lymphatic paralysis, even in our case, polyoconosis is the most common, and it affects the most uh, marginalized group and the poor group. Who will provide those logistics, especially the healthcare system does not know, does not consider those materials as a treatment for like the bleach, the soap and blah, blah. So who will provide those logistics, those patients? What about the teaming, the grouping? Uh, I have a concern there. If you only make the patient group, how do you see the issue of stigmatization? Besides, these people have to have at least financial support from uh, someone who has a certain amount of resource. So how do you see the grouping? How, how was your experience? I want to share it because we have a lot of skin and this here in Ethiopia. Thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. Well, thank you. Um, again, that's my personal opinion, and 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 I think that links with the um, the stages towards sustainability. I agree with you that at the very beginning, logistic needs to be given to strengthen the group. So I wouldn't, for example, if I want a proof of concept of uh, an advocacy program or on how self support groups or or community based groups have an effect on MDA compliance. I would you establish platforms. I wouldn't start from scratch. It would take a year or perhaps two years before having uh, the, the groups empowered to have you know, strong um, programmatic activities to, to, towards that end. So at the very beginning, I agree. I agree that, that logistics needs to be given vertically. It's not something that the health system can provide. But I can, I can, I can tell another thing, for example, in my experience, uh, that was um, that was the UMID project also. Sorry, yes, that was the, the one funded by Corinth City. We found in the formative evaluation that because the MMDP services the, for for LF were basically unexistent, could not be given. Part of the explanation is because they couldn't find any case. There's no, there were no cases registered in the system, and therefore capacity just dropped down. The, uh, some medical offices complain about many guidelines coming in and out, many uh, a training from international donors, but, but the, the whole program was abandoned. Because, but at the end of the day, uh, doctors also mentioned, because we don't have demand. And demand, where, where it starts, demand starts at the community. So if we mobilize population from the very bottom and we demonstrate demand, the demand for services, the, the, the supply will start raising accordingly. Uh, you mentioned about self-care kits or soap, or uh, I, I think this, these are materials, for example, in the Indian setting, there is a policy to provide a self-care kit to every um, people affected by lymphedema, but that was not given. 
But anyway, in focus group discussions, we found that people affected by LF did not care about self-care kits because they could access to these materials at home. Soap, um, buckets, um, towels, they, they, they have most of these materials on, on, at home. So they didn't request them. They want to gather together, identify their problems, and whenever they find a complication, they know where to go. Of course, this is an holistic pro a, a program. So CBGs alone will not function. You need also trained health uh, staff uh, at, the, at the PhD level. So this together, this is where it creates. And also, this is why the Aspire model implemented in Bihar is taking a three-pronged approach. It's not only about CBGs or strengthening the health system. It's also about bringing the, uh, the foot of, of active case funding to increase demand. Uh, so to, to create awareness in the government with a long-term advocacy program. So altogether, I guess, um, this needs to be taken into consideration. But I agree, logistics at the very beginning needs to be given by the organization and wait for a year before uh, they are strong enough to participate in high-level activities. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, really interesting insights and reflections and, and a brilliant question. Question. If others have questions or recommendations or suggestions from any of your own work, please do raise your hand or, or pop in the chat. There's a, um, a message from Maggie um, thanking you for, for the presentation and hoping that you'll, you'll share your slides, Guillermo, as I'm sure many of us are hoping. So hopefully we, we can do that through the iCords platform. Um, a question that, that I had as you were talking, really, and you talked throughout your presentation around um, the need for kind of more holistic focus within CBG. So thinking about things like mental health. Um, one of the things that comes up in a lot of our work is, is around livelihood support and, and how that can be integrated within um, CBG activities. And so perhaps a, a controversial question or, or something that I wanted to ask your opinion around is who should really be delivering these type of interventions and who should be supporting the rollout and the setup of, of CBG groups? Is it is it the health system? Is it other social systems? At the minute, it's largely driven by, by the NGO community. And so how do you see that moving forwards in, in a sustainable way? And, and how do we promote different sectors working together? Particularly on the livelihood or also on the mental health component? Well, I guess what, what you're describing in, in a CBG model in how you're describing it is the holistic approach that, yeah, yeah so should it just be the responsibility of the, of the health system? Yeah. <clears throat> I think, forward, who should it be? yeah, thanks, Laura. And I think there, is, there was a triangle. Uh, there was this paper from Marshall and others, remember, at the very beginning, this triangle between the uh, entity control programs, health systems and empowered communities. Well, the paper only highlights the entity control programs and the um, and the health systems, but the idea is is there. I, I think I think that's it's the three elements working together. So I don't think it's is one single approach or one size fits all approach. It's basically, for example, in the Aspire model in Bihar, where we have we are we having these three, three uh, pillars active case funding, health system strengthening, and, and, and CBGs, empowering communities. I think um, uh, we found a way, for example, how can health systems address the needs of people affected if they are currently not in a position to address simple complications? They just refer cases to district hospitals. How can we do that? So the, the advocacy plan is to consider an essential care package, at least for simple complications at PhD level. This is long term. At the same time, um, you know, a, a, um, a, a mental health programs a, a, at the very beginning, even if things are started or initiated by NGOs, the idea is that um, the whole model is self-sufficient. So for example, by bringing volunteers on the ground, the frontline workers, we need to be cautious depending on the setting. Sometimes they are overwhelmed by, by multiple programs in, in, in different countries have diff that they are overwhelmed and, and incentives are, are playing into account, need to be considered also in the equation and so on. But I think the whole thing needs to um, flow 
in, over over time. It's not a one year. I wouldn't I wouldn't test this in a year. Uh, I would I would test something uh, feasible over a two year uh, or three year uh, impact. Otherwise, this won't work. And also on, on established groups. But again, the whole thing starts most uh, sometimes it's, it's controversial because the idea where you want to establish ideally you want people affected to code or to, to start discussions bottom up but sometimes uh, uh, these ideas are put on the table and and it is the patients that can shape them so to be sustainable this happened in Bangladesh several times several ideas were put on the table and it was them once these CPGs are empowered who shape these ideas and told the program designers how this could be implemented or the delivery channels. But the delivery at the very beginning, at the inception point, this is tricky. It's again a process, I guess. Thanks, um, Guillermo. There's a, a comment from Alison, which I'll ask her to, to comment on in a second. But first, I think a, a million dollar question for us all that, that Daniel has raised. Um, but I would love to hear your response. Um, is it really possible to achieve the goals um, within the 2030 NTD roadmap? Is it a question to me? But, yes, and it, uh, it's your opportunity to plug how CBGs are going to get get us there. I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well mm, for what this is overall. <laughs> overall, uh, all of the goals. The million dollar question. Well, I'm answering uh, for me. I am Guillermo, not on representation <laughs> on anyone. <laughs> so this is recorded, no problem. <laughs> I personally think it's going to be very, very challenging. We have different scenarios. We have COVID. We had the COVID pandemic, where if there is evidence that, uh, particularly, for example, in leprosy, IDM diseases, we have only few diseases where new numbers of cases are being recorded. And we have seen a drop of more than 60% in some states of uh, new cases. If we are using um, national reports, if WHO uses uh, national reports to see how close we are from, from targets, this is a total, uh, you know, um, uh, this is, um, how can I say, we are, we are not uh, interpreting numbers correctly, right? We need to think of the missing cases. I think we need to th start thinking of, of holistic um, programs that includes uh, active case farting for certain diseases and address indirectly others. Uh, I think uh, most of the um, targets are output oriented. Uh, and I think these are challenging. I mean, I think this sparks a totally different um, uh, discussion, but uh, I, th I personally think it's gonna be very challenging. There are opportunities indeed. The rationale behind the roadmap is very interesting. I think there are very, very important elements that can be capitalized. Uh, we can capitalize on the existing uh, process, progresses that we've made, but I think it's gonna be challenge, challenging if, um, if we don't coordinate better across the main stakeholders that are um, in, the, in the NTD community. Thanks, Guillermo, and maybe that leads us nicely. Alison, I don't know if you want to reflect a bit more on your comment and perhaps coordination between MDA and CBG and how they can support each other. Yeah, no, it's just, um, it's something that I, I wrote a long message in the chat, so, <laughs> um, but it's something that, um, there's a, an older paper by Paul Canty, and I, I'll try and find it before we end so I can put it in the chat, but it was done in, in India um, years ago about how involving people um, with lymphedema in MDA really helped to improve um, the coverage in the, in the promotion. So I think this idea, Guillermo, that you posed earlier in your in your talk about or in your in your reflections about you know the cbg helping to support mdas and i think you know in places where people don't necessarily perceive lf to be an important risk and they maybe have had mda for many many years and they don't really see the value of coming out anymore we know that 
you know, it gets increasingly difficult to, to get people to take treatments uh, after many years. So, you know, involving these groups, I think could be really interesting in a way that's supportive and empowering and respectful, you know, and I think that's obviously key and, and with their willingness, but um, uh, I think it's an interesting point you raise and there's some evidence to support that. I, I mentioned also Haiti and Brazil that had, you know, a, a real history of, um, of self-help groups in the past. And I don't know if there's any evidence I'd have to, to look. It's a good exercise for someone to do to see if there's any evidence on, on those groups and the impact on MDA. But I just wanted to highlight that. And um, maybe it's a, an area for future research as you continue this to see, you know, if there is a bump in, in coverage when you have these really active groups, does it have any impact in the coverage of MDA in those areas? So thanks for your remarks and your talks. Thanks. Thanks, Alison. Just, just let, me, let me highlight one, one aspect. One of the things um, that we found also in the Indian setting is that even if, if, if um, communities receive the drug, many, like a substantial proportion, objects to, to take it or to share it with the rest of family members or household members. So that's something, you know, I took it as the man of the family most of the times, but in several, in many situations, the drug was held and not passed to the household members. So there is, there is a, uh, there, I think there is a, there are different categories uh, around adherence and different ways of approaching this, right? Thanks, um, Guillermo and Alison, for the, the really interesting reflections. I guess one final reflection that I would make, I guess, linked to the MDA and, and those who are missed, is around morbidity that's perhaps less visible from, from a lot of neglected tropical diseases as well. And, and perhaps the role of CBG models to support, for example, women and girls who have been affected by FGS, as, as well as these more kind of visible um, physical um, mobilities. But I guess, I think we don't have any more questions or, or reflections in the chat or, or hands up. So perhaps I'll pass back to Rachel um, to finish for the, today. And, and just to thank you again, Guillermo, I know Lots of people will be going away with lots of, of food for thought around this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Laura and Guillermo. I think um, you know today was a very interesting way to uh, gain a different perspective in terms of how um, we're bringing uh, treatments to different communities and how we're engaging with those communities. Um, so in case we have some people who aren't currently i members here, and if you're interested in joining, I've put the link um, in the chat and we will also be releasing um, the March Knowledge Cafe, which will be March 16th. So you're welcome to register for that as well. And then as we close off, I will just be releasing a poll just to get everybody's feedback in terms of how they felt the session went and, and what they learned. And we'd appreciate if you were able to provide that feedback. Um, but thank you to everyone who took the time out of their day to join and thank you to uh, Guillermo and Laura for uh, facilitating a very interesting discussion. Um, so we'll, we'll call it there for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good day.